Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig, um, for that introduction and to Cedar and Melinda and the team here. What a wonderful crowd. And to Cedar more generally, an organisation um, that is involved in providing a forum for a debate on the most topical economic and political issues of the day. Craig referred to Sir Robert Menzies and Menzies was fond of saying about politics that politics is a battle of ideas, not a clash of warring personalities. And I think that's all too important and we shouldn't forget that in the sparring that we see in state and federal parliaments and it's because of organisations like CEDA that we are able to, to have that discussion. Can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Well, as I stand here today, Australia is in its 27th year of consecutive economic growth. We've had tax cuts for business, for households. We're rolling out a $75 billion infrastructure plan. We've been able to reinstate the Australian Building and Construction Commission as a cop on the beat, which during the Howard era provided a $6 billion annual productivity dividend to the Australian economy. We've maintained our AAA credit rating and in the last 12 months, we've created more than 350,000 new jobs, 80% of which have been full-time. So the Australian economy is strong by domestic and by international standards. But in order for that job prosperity and that growth to continue, we need access to reliable and affordable power. But we haven't had that in Australia in recent years. And it was talked about being a hospital pass as a portfolio, maybe a poison chalice, I don't know, but when the Prime Minister rang me up after the last election and said, Josh, can you take on for the first time this integrated portfolio of energy and the environment, effectively energy and climate change policy, little did I know that we would have a statewide blackout, that we would have the announced and uh, ultimate closure of Hazelwood and then, of course, continuous rising gas prices. So it has been a tumultuous period in energy policy, but it's not confined to here in Australia. I recently got back from Bonn for the International Annual Climate Change Conference and I had an opportunity to meet with more than a dozen ministers from other countries. And they are going through the same stresses and strains in their own energy systems. Because what's happening in energy right now is the single greatest transformation in more than a century. The level of disruption is a bit like what the digital camera has done to Kodak film or what the mobile phone has done to the landline. It's completely turned, its, turned the whole system on its head. And it's in that environment that I thought today I'd share some thoughts with you, one on where we are today with our energy market, secondly, why we're in the position that we are in, and thirdly, what is the government's priorities and policies that we are going to focus on from here. In terms of where we are, power prices have been rising. In fact, what we have seen in the last decade is Australia going from having the fifth lowest power prices in the OECD to now having the 12th highest. And unfortunately, it's businesses in this room who are either competing against imports or competing on international markets who pay the price for those higher prices because it feeds directly into their competitiveness. It's also households who are pay a heavy price for rising power bills. The bottom 20% of income earners 
spend five times as much as a proportion of their disposable income on energy than the top 20% of income earners. So the burden falls disproportionately on those less well-to-do in our economy. In terms of the stability of our system, we've had, unfortunately, the first statewide blackout for decades when South Australia went into the black last September. A very significant event in more ways than one. Obviously, the economic costs ran into the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. You saw big companies like BHP have production interrupted at Olympic Dam. You saw lead smelters get into trouble. You saw tuna fishermen at Port Lincoln lose their catch. You saw people stuck in elevators. You saw gridlock on the roads. And you, lost, you saw people lose confidence in the reliability of their system. And having that level of interruption in South Australia was a warning sign to other markets right around the country of the challenges we face as the system transitions from a centralised system where everybody has been on the grid historically to a system now where we have more and more people who are off the grid. We have 17% of households who now have solar panels on their roofs. That is the most on a per capita basis anywhere in the world. We have a system now where we've historically relied on synchronous generation, which have come from the spinning turbines, predominantly coal but also gas, to now we have a system with more intermittent sources of power. Today we have 17% of power coming from renewables. That will grow to 23.5% by 2020 and grow significantly from there. The United States Energy Secretary in the Obama administration, when I spoke to him about the changes in our power system and we're talking about the rise of renewables, he described it as being like waves on the beach. You cannot stop this transition to more renewables or more intermittent sources of power, nor should we try to. But what we need to do is to manage that system more effectively. So we've gone from a system with synchronous generation where everybody has been relying on the grid, where there's been escalating demand for energy, to one where there's now a flatlining in demand, particularly as energy efficiency has taken hold. And we've also had a system historically in Australia where there's been surplus generation. So now we have a very tight supply demand balance. And here in Victoria, we're obviously focused on the summer ahead, post the closure of Hazelwood, South Australia too, New South Wales too, because we've seen 10 coal-fired power stations close in Australia in the last seven years. A very significant development, which has meant we've gone from having surplus capacity to now having a very tight supply demand balance until the committed generation starts to be built and comes online. So the system is very different to where it has historically been and we now as policymakers, are dealing with higher prices and less stability as a result. Now why are we here? That's the second point. I think the first thing to say is Nobody in this room has been well served by the political debates on energy policy that have been de bedeviled state and federal parliaments over the last decade. There's been a lack of consistency in policy, which has been problematic for those who are seeking to make the big investments in generation, but it also has meant more uncertainty in the market, which ultimately means higher prices. And that level of uncertainty could be worth a couple of hundred dollars a year to your power bill. And so we do need to end that. I think another part of the problem is there's been lack, a lack of attention placed on the need for storage when it comes to the power system. So as we've lost that synchronous generation 
and brought in more wind and solar, we haven't put in the backup storage that we so urgently need. And as you know, not all electrons are created equal. So the wind blows 35% of the time and you might get generation from a wind farm. For a solar farm, you might get generation 25% of the time. Well, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you need that backup storage. We've been completely underdone on pumped hydro facilities, even though 99% of the world's storage for renewables is actually in pumped hydro. We only have three pumped hydro facilities here in Australia. Battery technology has been embraced, but it's been too expensive to now. And we want to see more investments in particularly lithium-ion batteries and storage. But we haven't placed any emphasis in this country or sufficient emphasis on storage, and Prime Minister Turnbull has made that actually a major focus for his government. So there's been a lack of certainty in the policy settings. There's been a lack of focus on storage as backup as we get more intermittent sources of power. The rise in gas prices has been another driver of the higher power bills that we've faced. As we've lost those coal-fired power stations, gas has played a greater role in setting the price of electricity. Gas is a critical transition fuel, but gas prices have tripled in Australia in the last five years. And we have a particular problem here on the east coast of Australia when it comes to gas prices. In the United States, they're paying three to four dollars a gigajoule. Here in Victoria, we could be paying 10 to 12 dollars a gigajoule of gas. And what we've seen is two things happen. One is we've started to export two thirds of what we produce on the east coast of Australia. And second, we've seen blanket bans and moratoriums on the development of not just unconventional gas, which does involve often fracking, but also conventional gas on shore, which is really regrettable because it means we're not getting the supply into the market that we need. So gas prices, or gas, set the price of electricity twice as often in 2017 as it did two years prior. And when you consider gas prices are three times what they were five to six years ago, that has meant much higher prices for you. Another big driver of the higher prices that we've been paying in power has been a result of the overbuild in what are called the poles and the wires, or the networks. Rod Sims, as the head of the ACCC, gave an important speech at the press club a few months ago where he said that nearly half the rise in power bills over the last decade could be attributed to an overbuild or a gold plating in poles and wires. And this is because state governments have set standards which have been very high for reliability and as a result we are spending lots and lots of money to meet that peak demand for just a few hours or a few days every year. It's been estimated that we have 11 billion dollars worth of poles and wire assets that are regulated, meaning that you pay a regulated return to the owners of those poles and wires that are used these assets, these $11 billion of assets, are used less than 1% of the year, or around 1% of the year. So it could be four days of the year we're using this $11 billion of assets, but right through the year we're all paying for it. So in terms of why we are where we are, it's because we've had a lack of policy certainty, we've had higher prices for gas, we've failed to put in place the storage that we need, and because we've had an overbuild in the networks. So where do we go from here and what is the government's plan to get a more stable and affordable system as we seek to meet our Paris commitments to reduce emissions? The first thing we, do, we need to do is we need to integrate energy and climate policy. And this is what's been lacking in Australia over the last decade. And this is where we went to the Energy Security Board, who are the foremost body of experts in energy policy in this country, and we asked for their best policy proposal. The Energy Security Board was a recommendation of the Finkel Review, and it comprises five people. 
the head of the Australian Energy Market Commission, which is the rule maker, the head of the energy market operator, um, and the head of the energy market regulator, the Australian Energy Regulator. And there's an independent chair, Kerry Schott, and a deputy independent chair, Claire Savage. They recommended to, to us that we should adopt what is called the National Energy Guarantee. And this, for the first time ever, will integrate energy and climate policy into one single mechanism. What it does is it creates two new obligations on energy retailers. The first obligation goes to the reliability of the system. It says to those retailers, a certain proportion of the assets that you own or you run or the energy that you sell in the market will have to be dispatchable. What is dispatchable power? It's power that is available on demand. That could be gas, that could be coal, that could be hydro, that could be wind and solar with storage, or it could be what is called demand side response. So suddenly, for the first time ever, we will have the retailers having to provide a certain amount of dispatchable power. The second obligation on the energy retailers is that of their assets or of the power that they sell, it will have to have a certain amount of emissions intensity that declines over time till you get to 2030, because 2030 is the point where we've committed to reducing our emissions in the, elect in the Australian economy by 26 to 28% by 2030 on what they were in 2005 levels. So over time, the emissions in the electricity sector will fall and the electricity retailers will have to ensure they have a certain amount of assets that conform to that requirement. So they can decide how do they meet that. Do they want to have one coal-fired power plant with one solar farm? Do they want to have two gas-fired power plants? Do they want to have a gas-fired power plant with a wind farm with a battery? Or do they want to have new a new lower emission coal-fired power plant with a pumped hydro facility? Whatever the mix they decide they want to have, they are in the best position to determine what their portfolio of assets will require. Now, we had some modelling done on what would be the consequences of this policy. And the modelling was that we will see energy prices come down in the terms of the wholesale price by 23%. That's an enormous amount, particularly to the large users of energy. For a household bill, that could mean $120 a year saving. If you are a chemical factory, that could mean a $1.4 million a year saving. If you're a large supermarket, that could mean a $400,000 a year saving. If you're a paper manufacturer, that could be a $10 million a year saving. Or indeed, we're at Blue Scope at Port Kembla's uh, Steelworks um, earlier last week, and that will mean a $13 million annual saving to their energy bill simply by getting more stability in the energy system so we can get a proper, um, a proper level of investment going forward. The National Energy Guarantee has been warmly received right across the board. Everyone from, uh, and I did, they're in the room, in the Clean Energy Council has said, let's do some more work on this, to the Energy Council, to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to the Australian Industry Group, to the Business Council of Australia, to the big users of power, the Blue Scopes, the BHPs. They've all said, we're tired of the argy-bargy that has dominated this area of policy over the last decade, and this offers our best way forward. So what we are doing is now we're working through the detail. We had a constructive and productive meeting of the COAG Energy Council last Friday. We got the states to support additional work being done. That will now be worked through to April, where hopefully we'll have a fully fledged design of this policy that we can keep working through from there and requiring changes to the national electricity market rules and changes to legislation. 
So the National Energy Guarantee offers, us, offers a way forward and it builds on the additional things that we're doing to rein in the power of the, the electricity networks, the work we've done to get more gas into the market and the work that we're doing with the retailers. So it's an absolutely fascinating time in energy policy. There's no doubt we're dealing with a system which is undergoing dramatic transformation and change and a huge amount of unprecedented level of technology disruption. This also creates enormous amount of opportunities as we move to demand side response, smart grids, virtual power plants, things that weren't even thought about a decade or more ago. This is what's happening in the electricity sector, but as far as the government is concerned, we know what our priorities are. We need to integrate energy and climate policy. We need to provide more gas into the domestic market. We need to rein in the power of the networks and we need to get a better deal for millions of Australians from the retailers. All the things that we're actioning and we're trying to do as much as we can in a bipartisan way and to work with our state and territory counterparts because we truly need a national response if we're going to get a national solution. Thank you very much.